Eagle Nation, uh, excited beyond belief here to speak with Lisa Hallett, uh, co-founder and the executive director for Wear Blue, Run to Remember. Um, she is an absolute uh, remarkable leader. I've come to know her over the past 10 years. Uh, we'll get into that in a little bit in a minute. Um, but her husband, John Hallett, um, was killed in Afghanistan in, in 2009. And uh, I was actually, uh, I'm sorry, was it 2010 or 2009? No, 2009, you're correct. 2009. And, and that's where like, you know, part of my relationship with Lisa begins is because I was deployed in 2009 in the Kandahar province of Afghanistan. Um, and some of my good friends who actually were board members of Team Red, White and Blue were, you know, were in the brigade that John was in. And I knew about what a stud he was back at West Point on the water water polo team. Um, but it, my first time that I met Lisa in person was at Team Red, White & Blue's first uh, event, the Twin Cities Marathon on October 3rd, 2010. So uh, first of all, Lisa, great to be spending some time with you here today and excited to be able to share with Eagle Nation a little bit about you know, your journey and then really about the organization that you have led and really created. And, and of course, then we're going to talk most of our time uh, focused on the big partnership we've got coming up for Memorial Day. Yeah, I'm excited. It feels full circle to be back here today. Um, just 10 years after we first ran together at the Twin Cities Marathon. Now, was that your first marathon? I, I don't remember. Was that one or have you, had you run like lots of marathons before that and you just came out? No, running had always been how I dealt with the challenges of military life. John mm -hmm. went to Ranger School. I said, I'm going to run a marathon. Um, but it was my first big PR yeah. in a yeah. marathon and it yeah. was great because there was absolutely there was my 5-2 family you know um, with the Lynn family mm -hmm. and um, actually there's a ton of synergy the military family is small and so there had been um, many many of friends who said you've got to meet Mike Irwin let me tell you about RWB and it was um, a lot of fun and you and I jumped into you know, a friendship right from there, really starting to talk about, hey, what are you doing with Team Red, White, and Blue? What are you doing with Wear Blue? And really building our messaging alongside each other in this shared commitment to support our Absolutely. military and their families. Yeah, and, and just going back to that a little bit, you know, um, you know, and again, some of it's a little awkward for me because I know all the answers to these questions, right, <laughs> since I've known you since this time and all that. So I just want to ask them for the benefit really of everybody. So can you just talk a little bit about like the, the creation of Wear Blue, how it started in, in, in such, you know, powerful, like every organization, but humble beginnings and then what it's grown to. Maybe just kind of take us back you know, to a little bit of that beginning um, and then we'll kind of unpack it from there. Yeah, I appreciate that. So in July of 2009, John's unit, Fifth Striker Brigade, deployed to southern Afghanistan as a part of the surge that we saw in 2009. And um, we quickly realized that it was going to be a very challenging deployment. And we lost 41 service members that year, to include my husband, John. And John was killed six weeks into the deployment. I had a three-year-old, a one-year-old, and a three-week-old baby. And uh, my world was upside down, and it was heartbroken. And I wasn't alone in that. And as a community, we were really looking for a way to heal and grieve and connect. And we started running together and it was tangible. So the first time we met, it was the Burger King parking lot. And there's maybe 15 of us. And we kind of looked at each other awkwardly. And then we ran around the airfield at Joint Base Lewis McCord. And then we evolved and each week, a new element came to it. A new family member came to it. And it became a lifeline in how we were able to support one another between just a heart-wrenching time, um, a way for us to speak the names, the guys and gals who'd been lost downrange, and a way to hold on to something to move forward. And so that first year, we threw 40 flags out on Rock and Roll Seattle Marathon's race course, mm -hmm. and about 30 of us ran the half of the full marathon. And it was a tangible accomplishment. And we literally and figuratively became a memorial to our guys. And they lived in how we were living and it was powerful. Um, but the unit came home from that deployment. And we realized that they needed the same things that we needed, the space to heal and to grieve. And really words just weren't big enough after that deployment. And how do you say, I'm so sorry for your loss. Thank you for that incredible service and sacrifice. And we realized that with running, movement, walking, gathering in a community, we didn't have to have the right words. We were mm -hmm. able to literally and figuratively move forward from and through that deployment um, in the steps of the run with the support of the Wear Blue community. 
and that was that was our our origin yeah. and then we grew military is a transient a transient community and so as people headed to a new duty station fort bragg north carolina springfield virginia they would take wear blue with them and so now wear blue is a national community focused on running the honors the service and sacrifice of the american military uh, we have about 50 running communities um, but out of that we have six different programs that are all focused on empowering our families of the fallen, supporting our military and their families, and of course, always remembering the service members who have made the ultimate sacrifice. Yeah, I love, and I love you, the motto, it's, it's for the fallen, that is it for the families and for the fighting, or, or what's the order, it's for the fallen. <laughs> for the fallen, There's, for the fighting, for the families. The families, yeah, I love that, that's awesome. Yeah, I know, you know, going back to that briefly, as I mentioned before, you know, so I was deployed in southern Afghanistan um, in Kandahar until July of 2009, right? And so I, I was there as the surge was being announced. And so like John's unit was coming in, you know, um, 5-2 was was uh, inbound um, and, 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 you know, at that time. And it's the summer and we always know that things picked up then. And, and it was one of those things for all of us who were leaving at the time, like it was a tough time for us to leave just knowing uh, you know, just the intensity of the fight that, that lay ahead of them. And, um, you know, I remember, you know, talking to, to Sam Lynn, right, then Major Lynn, mm -hmm. just about, you know, just what remarkable mm -hmm. bravery uh, and, and just incredible, um, you know, things, you know, the unit did because it was like the most pivotal part of all of Afghanistan. For those who know, and have been to Afghanistan, right, Kandahar, Kandahar City area, it's sort of the spiritual center of the country, right, really, really keep, you know, keep part of that terrain. So, um, you know, so as you, as you shared out like a little bit of like that, you know, the beginnings and then, and how it's grown, I would love to just hear a little bit, you know, about, um, you know, as you look at the organization, right. So from bird's eye view, right. The, as mm -hmm. the executive director, um, and, and you kind of look at, can you kind of give us a layout of like where lots of, you know, your communities are centered around? Cause I know like, you know, there's one outside Fort Bragg here in Fayetteville, but like, you know, um, where a lot of them are at, um, and like, what is a typical, uh, you know, engagement look like for, you know, for your communities? Absolutely. So we have 53 communities and about half of our communities are situated outside the gates of a military installation, very intentionally bridging mm -hmm. our military and civilian communities. And each of our, we're blue is grounded in the Saturday run. And that's really the crux of who we are and what we do. And it's a continuous gathering of the military, their families, families of the fallen, veterans, and community members in a shared space. And each of our runs start with the circle of remembrance. And we speak the names of service members who were killed on that weekend in the global war and terror since September 11th. Um, but we open it up as well for the community to speak the names for whom they are taking purposeful steps that weekend. And so in my community, Mike Brown speaks the name of First Lieutenant Peter Lance, who was killed in Vietnam in 1967. And Rachel Elizalde calls out the name of her brother, Adrian, who was killed in Iraq in 2007. And there's this mix of generations of community members coming together in the shared space of understanding, support, and remembrance. And even more so, how do we celebrate those lives of those who made the ultimate sacrifice and live inspired and motivated by that? And then we go out for a run or walk, you know, based on what your ability and your interests are. Um, but it's all the benefits of movement and even more the benefits of community. How do we yeah. stand on our own, but not alone? I was gonna, that was gonna be my next question for you. So I, I've got my answer, I know what it is, but like, what is it for you and your own experience and from talking to you know, thousands of you know, your members over the years who have talked about the power, like what is it specifically about the physical act of running that is, that is therapeutic or that is helpful to you? Um, I love going to the National Mall and seeing the Vietnam Wall, the Korean mm -hmm. War Memorial. I mean, the anguish on the faces of the service members uh, at the Korean War Memorial, it, it's powerful. And, but they literally and figuratively leave you in stasis, right? You mm -hmm. stop in grief and remembrance. Mm -hmm. And what is so powerful for me with running or walking we become the living memorial. And so that remembrance and that legacy can truly live in us when we are moving, right? And so we take the steps of the run and the stories to really drive our footsteps forward with meaning and purpose, 
but that becomes foundational in how we move forward in the rest of our lives. And so it's a powerful tool to move from a, a static remembrance into a life of remembrance, which is really a life of inspiration, motivation, and connections to generations of service and sacrifice. Yeah, I like that. And, and of course, you know, we know like, you know, and that's, that's an awesome inspirational answer. Right? Sometimes I go with like, I don't know, like the physiological like uh, component of just like, you know, uh, I think runner's world one time, like, you know, quoted me by saying like, you know, there's something symbolic about running. It's about putting one foot in front of the other, mm -hmm. you know, and as I think about, you know, like just that, that symbolic gesture, right. Of just continuing to go, right. Sometimes like you don't want to, but you just keep forcing that one foot in front of the other. And then of course, there's just like, you know, that benefit, we know physiologically and psychologically from the data that, right. That working up a sweat helps to flush out cortisol and, right. and helps to create endorphins and, you know, all those kinds of things so that we can, you know, hopefully, you know, be in a better mood, be able to focus better, all those kinds of things that, that we need in our lives we know so when you combine like the inspirational element of what you talked about coupled with some of the more you know physiological stuff like it's it's a powerful combination of like why in other words why running right right and, you know and, and it's it's what we know <laughs> yeah. service every single service member knows the run yeah. um, and their families too and there are some great support institutions um, for our military families embedded in the structure of our military um, but i love taking a step outside of that and being for the military, but not being made by the military itself. And mm -hmm. I think that's the power of a VSO right now. How do we come alongside and be a support arm and provide an alternative to how we connect, how we support, and how we cope with the continuing challenges of military life in our nation's mm -hmm. longest war? Yeah, absolutely. And on that, uh, and I was going to uh, tee this up a little bit earlier, but you know, I wanted to wait, I guess, until the right moment for it. So now you, you talk about, you know, running or walking based upon ability level, but you, I've been tracking obviously just via Facebook over the years, you have done some pretty epic things. Uh, in fact, uh, Team RDB's uh, Director of Digital Experience, Dan Brostick, you know, he's done, I think the Lake Tahoe, the Lake Tahoe 200 miler, but he was at an ultra marathon that, that he was like, I think the only one that he didn't complete and you did. And, and he said like, <laughs> it was, it was brutal conditions that day. And I think it was a hundred miler, but so can you talk about just, you know, for, you know, for our listeners and people watching in, like, like what are some of the, like the, the most sort of epic physical uh, challenges you've taken on, you know, in these past 10 years since leading wear blue? Um, go big or go home. Uh, <laughs> <laughs> I think, you know, running has been such a lifeline since John was killed. And so it absolutely started with, you know, a pretty ugly run in the first days after John was killed, um, but became something tangible. Grief was incredibly scary for my children. My oldest was three mm -hmm. when John was killed. And I remember crying one day and, and Jackson says, mommy, stop crying. You're scaring me. And um, it was a big emotion. And it was just such a mm -hmm. wake up call that my kids deserved a full life and running was the avenue for me to be honest with myself and to mm -hmm. feel all the big feelings that come with losing your best friend. Um, but to still have that space to rebound, to push off, to move forward and get into that good place that I deserved it too. And so, you know, when a marathon didn't become long enough, um, I ran a double marathon with Team yep. Red, White, and Blue. Yep. Um, we started it. That was one of my favorite running experiences. You knew we had a mix of uh, members from your community and a mix of yep. members from my community. We started at midnight at the Golden Gate National Cemetery, and we threw a flashing light on the top of our cars. If you put a flashing light on the yep. top of your car, anything is possible. Yeah. <laughs> and we ran the streets of San Francisco at night with the American flag in our hand. Yeah really celebrating our country, the men and women who served to protect it, and, um, and the families they leave behind. And it was, um, it sits with me forever as one of my favorite yeah. runs. Um, but from that, I did Ironman World Championships in Kona, mm -hmm. Hawaii. And um, pretty humbling to compete with the very best in the, yeah. um, the best in the world. And at one point, I'm climbing up um, one of the one of the hills on my bike and the wind is pushing me across across the bike lanes and I'm like I don't know if I can do it and then I think about 77 year old sister Madonna who was mm -hmm. also riding her bike and there was definitely a moment of suck it up Palette, you got it yeah. you can do this <laughs> um, but I think that's what's so powerful about the sport there is every ability size experience mm -hmm. out there on the course and there is a reminder that 
you can fight through anything and, you know, keep pushing, don't give up because there is someone out there who is pushing a little harder and they're going to achieve that carrot. Um, But I'm particularly proud this past September, I ran my first 100 mile race. And um, 2019 was 10 years since John was killed in combat and life is busy and we're so often on fast forward juggling Mm -hmm careers, our kids, and just the daily life that falls in between. And I wanted to give John our marriage, his sacrifice, our lives, everything we've achieved since then, the space that it deserved. hundred miles. It was not an option that day. No, it wasn't. That's, that's amazing. That's awesome. uh, Yeah. Wow. Keep going. Sorry. Yeah, no, just I, you know, I ran a hundred miles. I remember the first marathon after I finished I looked at my phone and I waited for John to call and he didn't right? John had been killed in combat. He wasn't coming home. He wasn't going to call and say, I saw your hard work. I see your finish. And it, I just kept waiting for this phone to ring. And at the end of my hundred mile, I looked around at my friends and my family and it was that phone call of John. They didn't leave me behind and they were there to see those terrible training runs, the great, ter- the great runs. And um, they were with me and they were that phone call I've been waiting so many years for. Oh, that's powerful. Um, yeah. Wow. Um, so yeah. 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 So many questions we could, we could spend all day kind of just talking about like ultra marathons and all that kind of stuff, you know, going back to San Francisco. Um, yeah. That was, you know, geez, again almost yeah basically eight plus years ago I guess Mm -hmm. in the summer of 2011 or 12 it was Uh um yeah there's something you know eerily awesome about running the streets uh, of especially of a bigger city or like around there like in the middle of the night when most people are are asleep you know um and so to do that you know that was that was a really cool run um and of course you know as yeah, I remember like I forgot my wear blue shirt then. So I've got it. I've got it right back here now. <laughs> my, ba- my baby is sleeping, but uh, of course I'll be wearing my wear blue shirt um, when we talk about Memorial Day here in a minute um, in, in our partnership. But, you know, that was just an incredible uh, event. And of course, the San Francisco Marathon is so huge. And you're running over the Golden Gate Bridge and you're already like 30 miles in and you're smoked because you haven't got any sleep. I mean, that, that, was, uh, that, was, that, was, that was that was a wild journey. So Yeah, it was. Um, um as you train about is just a quick question on that like about so about that that 100 so like what was like your longest training run like what did that look like to be able to get you ready you said before a failure is not an option like on such a, a symbolic uh, powerful you know uh you know run for you like so what was the longest run you put in how did you get yourself like psychologically but also physically ready for 100 miles because you know i get a lot of heat from people you know i've done a lot of 50s you know i've done some things but I, i've not done 100 yet i just don't know if my stomach <laughs> Because like once I get going like that deep in, my mm-hmm. stomach just doesn't like the carbs and doesn't like the food, and so I start cramping up in my legs. Once I start getting deep into like the JFK 50 mile or like mile right. 40, I got to start hammering my legs to 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 kind of push through the the cramping. So how did all that work out for you? Uh, number one is coach. I mean, right? We mm-hmm. how do we want to get better at something? I don't think we ever outgrow the need for a coach, and mm-hmm. and especially I think when we're in charge of our lives, our, our careers, and our families we're making all the decisions. And I think we had a lot of decision fatigue. And so having a coach and being the person who's thinking through my training process and telling me what to do was the real lifeline. I didn't have to be in charge of that. I just had to execute. There's also Mm -hmm. somebody who listened a little bit to my whining on the way (laughs) who doesn't appreciate that. Um, But having a coach, we really moved to a model of doubles. So about three times a week, I'm I'm running the roads twice. So really preventing Mm -hmm. fatigue, getting the miles in, but making sure my body's staying in good form and healthy with that. Yeah. And my longest run really leading up to it was a six hour run, which is wow. maybe 30 miles, but it's that cumulative week of training right. and really getting those high miles up there and having kids who are willing to support that. And then on race day, it's, it's making friends. I mean, I think you do know, so many ultra yeah. marathoners in both of our communities. And I think that's what really feeds me or draws me back to the support, the sport on the way, you know, the different people you meet and, who hear your story and tell you their story and, and don't let you give up. And I remember one yeah. point I'm, I'm in the woods and I'm like, I'm going to take a break. And this one's like, no, it's your first. I won't leave you. And she's waiting for me. And there's no reason, no reason yeah. she had to, but it, it's, it's the game, the race. It reminds you you're not alone. And, and if a stranger is willing to stand on your side to keep you going, mm-hmm. anything's possible. 
Yeah, that's awesome. I mean, one hope, gives hope to any of us out there who are aspiring to one day do a, do a 100 miler. Um, yeah, you know, that, that, Hey, like, you know, the longest you can do in the train. Cause I think a lot of people kind of think, Oh, I got to do like a 12 hour train up or something like that. And I've heard that before that now you can do like a six, seven hours is your longest one. And maybe mm -hmm. you run some marathons as, as train ups, you know, yeah. but, uh, but, uh, but yeah, that's, that's really helpful to know. And, and that's a great point about the coach as well, having someone to kind of guide you through it. And that becomes, I think, like you said, increasingly important with, you know, I, I, I love that phrase decision fatigue. And, and I agree that we all make so many decisions in a given day and, you know, if you have to add on something like that, that you don't know the answers to, I think it probably just increases the anxiety that you might have, you know, in the event of like, am I going to be actually be ready when I tow the line on race day? Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Absolutely. No, I can't great. wait. We'll talk, we can talk later yeah. about which 100 yeah. mile you'll do. Yes. Yes. I, uh, I keep on getting heat to like people like, what's it, what's it going to be? What's it going to be? So um, awesome. Well, hey, let's maybe take like the, you know, the, like the last 15 minutes of the conversation here to really talk about, you know, something that you and I are both so pumped up about. We talked about this before we, we hit record and started talking here, but, you know, we've been in this conversation now for about six weeks and that is the partnership with Wear Blue, Run to Remember and Team Red, White and Blue uh, as we prepare for Memorial Day. Um, this year it's May 25th, but yeah, we'd love to kind of walk us through like a little bit of, um, you know, what Wear Blue has typically done in the pre-COVID times, right, on Memorial Day and, and how that's, you know, altered right now with the, the, the situation, you know, physical slash social distancing and all that. And, and then how uh, our communities, our organizations are going to come together to make a real uh, big impact for so many on Memorial Day. Absolutely. So Memorial Day has been an integral part of the work that Wear Blue does for the years. I mean, since the beginning, right, we're, we're born, mm -hmm. um, I want to say out of loss, but not out of loss. We're born out of the lives remembered, really. Mm -hmm. And um, on Memorial Day, nowhere is there a more pressing call to action for us to remember um, than on that last Monday of May. And so each year on Memorial Day, we challenge our country to join us in taking purposeful steps in honor of our fallen service members. And there's never any cost to participants. Um, there's no speed, no distance requirement. We just ask people to choose a distance that is meaningful to them to then run or walk on Memorial Day. And so our nation at large comes to our web website and Wear Blue actually creates a hero match. We provide the name and story of a fallen service member for our communities um, to remember on Memorial Day. And so traditionally what this looks like are about a hundred communities around the world from Iwakuni, Japan, to Anchorage, Alaska, to Fort Lewis, Washington, um, but just a mix of their communities coming together, having a circle of remembrance with hundreds of their neighbors, speaking the names of generations of fallen service members, and then taking purposeful steps. And it is a chance um, to give space and remembrance to the men and women who've made the ultimate sacrifice but it's also a chance for our service members, our veterans and their families to stand in solidarity um, for their shared sacrifices. There's not a day that goes by that a service member doesn't think about the guys and gals that were lost downrange. They don't mm -hmm. need to be told to remember. Um, but on Memorial Day, it's a chance for us to come together in this shared experience. And- Sorry, um, Got a little visitor popping in my head here. <laughs> <laughs> I know all about little visitors. So, yeah. <laughs> Sorry. Oh, yeah. no. So, and so it's been great. And in, in, since 2017, through the support of USAA Foundation, we have launched a youth mentorship program for children of fallen military. And we pair children of fallen military with currently serving members of our armed forces in a run-focused mentorship. And for 10 weeks with almost 40 mentorship hours, these kids and their mentors, they connect. Um, the children learn about a life of service. They develop healthy coping mechanisms. They train to run a 5K. And um, ultimately, they're learning about a life of service and reclaiming their lost identities as military kids. And then on Memorial Day, they join their broader community and run that 5K run in honor of that their fallen parent. And it's powerful. So traditionally, we have thousands around the world in a shared effort to honor and remember the fallen um, with this culminating event um, for some of our nation's 11,000 gold star youth. 
Things look a little That's different incredible. this year. Yeah, yeah, <laughs> yeah, yeah. So, so yeah, <laughs> before before you talk about that right now, yeah, I mean, just how incredible. I mean, the idea of you know the mentorship component. Yeah, you know, and you were I talked about this a little bit before uh, we hit record, but you know the idea of how important it is for you know to help, especially children who have lost a parent, right? To have those healthy coping me coping mechanisms as they think about going on, you know, you know, to high school and especially on to college. Absolutely, and it's there are amazing opportunities for our kids that they deserve and they are amazing kids. And so our gold star youth, they don't need things, they need people and experiences. And so if we can give them a strong foundation, they'll learn to stand on their own, but not be alone. And in creating that foundation, we're really giving them the tools to be successful throughout life. And if we think of the most powerful ways that we can remember and honor the fallen, if we can, you know, what is the give back we give to a service member who made the ultimate sacrifice? Mm -hmm. It's by caring for their families. Yeah. You know, we honor the fallen by making sure their children are not crippled by that sacrifice, um, but em empowered in a really mm -hmm. rich and beautiful way um, by their unique life experiences so that they can go forth and achieve the things and the potential that they were meant to achieve. Yeah. Yeah. That's, that's a really powerful way of phrasing it. Um, you know, and so this year I see with the uh, coronavirus and, and all the, the challenges that's, you know, brought upon so many different, um, you know, organizations across the country and the world. So, so what is the game plan? Uh, you know, what, what are, what are we going to do here together and, and how is it going to look, you know, from, uh, you know, from what you can see right now? Well, the, the biggest thing is running is not canceled and community is not canceled. Achievement is not canceled. And so on Memorial Day, we continue to run to remember. Um, but more than ever, it's so important that as we think about what community is and who we are as a community, that we get beyond, I think, kind of the boundaries we sometimes set up and think about how can we be a richer, more meaningful community. And so that is where we are coming together to partner with Team Red, White, and Blue. Um, to build a really meaningful community. Our, our, our runners and our participants um, for years have worked together and, and really identified one another as teammates. And as we move toward Memorial Day, we want to create the space when we all feel, I, I feel just a little bit alone uh, taking all of my steps by myself right now. Um, yeah. How do we come together? And I think step one is to work with our partners in this space and partners who share values and vision and a commitment to our military, their families, their veterans, and their families with fallen. And so we are really excited to come alongside where um, Team Red, White, and Blue, and for us to work together to create a national event. We are still a community, um, mm -hmm. but we're gonna simply share this experience out of, our, out of our back doors and take purposeful steps on Monday, May 25th, in honor of our nation's fallen military heroes. Awesome. And we're, yeah, you know, we are so excited about this, yeah, you know, to, to be partnering with Wear Blue uh, and to encourage, you know, all of our members and, and beyond, right? Like really the idea here is how do we get the word out to as many people as possible, um, you know, about this opportunity because, um, you know, you're right. Like running is not canceled. I love it. It's like a running is not canceled. Like community is not canceled. Like I love it. It's like, uh, it's true. Right. I mean, like, yeah. And this is something I'm really interested in as we kind of move forward, like as a nation, like what is the balance between virtual and in real life opportunities that are necessary to foster a community? Um, you know, pre technology, pre information age, like community was built exclusively like what you did together in person in the same room and over time right whether it's through social media whether it's through our phones you know all the various ways that we've been able to to connect and more importantly stay connected right in in between all those in-person moments right that's that's the big question you know for me is how do you how do you balance both and so obviously this year where we, where we don't have the opportunity to come together in real life we still have the chance to to be in community with people uh, by participating you know, meaning, making your, your steps meaningful and dedicated to in honor of, right, someone who made the ultimate sacrifice. And then I think a part of this, as you've talked about, is making sure that, you know, we really encourage people to share this out on social media. This is not just, yes, you can do it on your own quietly, and, 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 and that's going to work for some people, but there's also an opportunity to be able to share you know, that, that hero match that you talk about, the name, the face, the story of somebody. And, you know, like all of us, you know, I've, I've got some, you know, close friends who've lost 
you know, a son, a three-year-old son, I've like people who've lost, you know, um, children, friends. And when you talk to anybody um, about that, like the biggest thing, you know, that, that comes up over and over and over again is it's that I don't want my son or my daughters or my brothers, whatever, like, name and, and their story to be forgotten right and i think mm -hmm. that people kind of know that hey over time right like you know that it's it's not easy but it's just natural when other things start coming in right that you that you tend to sometimes not forget but like it's not from the top of mind so I, i'm i love like this image of the the parents or the siblings or the, you know the gold star families right to you know my dream would be that they see like somebody that they don't know they see one of their friends share right a public mm -hmm. image Right. Of like, hey, do you know someone's running in honor of your daughter or your, you know, you know what I mean? Like how powerful that would be that to know that, you know, 14 or 16 years after, uh, you know, they were killed in action, that that their name and their story is still being told. To me, that gives me chills. Uh, me too. <laughs> me too. That is right. It's terrifying to think that our loved ones, their best friends are going to be forgotten. Mm -hmm. and um, their lives are worthy of remembrance. And so on Memorial Day, yes, there, there's not a day that goes by that I don't think about John. Mm -hmm. um, but remembering can be lonely. Mm -hmm. And um, as time passes, I need help remembering. My kids need help remembering. My kids yeah. need to know that their dad is not forgotten. And yeah. so on Memorial Day, it'll be so oh, stirring. Yeah. For, for people to flood their social media, say, I remember today, I took, I did something, right? I didn't just right. remember him, I see, I did right. something. Right. And to take that name, and today I learned the story of Private First Class Lyndon Anson Marcus, or I learned the story of Captain Corey Jenkins. Here's his picture. And that across the world, our families that fallen will know that they belong to a grateful nation that yeah. they do not carry the burden and the responsibility and the joy of remembering alone. And I hope that our service members as well find place and a community that respects, honors that sacrifice um, that they've carried um, yeah. now through generations of war. Yeah, hundred percent. That's a, that's a great way of, of really framing it and uh, powerful. Um, so yeah. Um, yeah, I'm not sure if I want to end, uh, can end on a more power. I, I've heard people just say, okay, just cut the recording. Like, let's just end it here. Um, so I, I guess just to kind of, you know, sort of wrapping it up with, you know, I guess a few more kind of just, uh, you know, admin pieces or whatever, you know, from, you know, from our end, we'll, you know, we're going to be sharing this out with everybody, but encouraging okay. our members to, to go to, it's, it's wearblue.org. Is that correct? That's what Wear blue run to remember. remember dot dot org. Org. Okay. Name. And it's on all the messaging that yep. you've shared. Thank you. Yep. But cl simply click on that main page and then you'll provide your information. Um, you'll be able to share if you're with Team Red, White, and Blue as well. Um, yep. And then as you commit your miles, uh, we will provide the name and story of a fallen service member to honor with your staff. You actually also receive a graphic as well that's reshareable mm -hmm. and it features that service member so you can easily um, share their story. Um, awesome. But we do invite everyone, there's no cost. Um, yeah. You choose a distance that works for you, um, but share it and invite someone else to remember. Um, it is such a gift to give our families of the fallen yeah. and, and just really one another. Yeah, totally. That's the power, right? Is that this is, uh, there's so many different stakeholders here that, that benefit, right? The, uh, the family, the gold star families who have lost somebody, um, but you benefit as well our nation benefits, right? The list goes on, the, 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 our active duty guard reserve where people are still serving, knowing that they could be called to deploy somewhere and be asked to make, you know, uh, you know, an incredible sacrifice. Like, I mean, so just every stakeholder that you can think of, you know, uh, is better off uh, by our participation in this, right? And that's why our, our organization is so fired up to get behind it. And that's why, you know, we hope to, you know, continue locking arms and get the message out between now and May 25th to get as many people as possible to, to, to join and to do as well. Um, and so we're, we're really excited, Lisa. You know, I, I just want to thank you for your time. Thanks for sharing some of the background, the story, and the journey of Wear Blue. And, and of course, you know, spending a little bit of time there talking about some of your own epic, uh, amazing uh, stuff that you've done and, and really 
dialing in on the partnership that we've been communicating out and we're going to continue to push you know to to all of our members and, and really excited and of course this is year one and, and it can only grow from here where i think there's so much potential and hopefully in post covid years when we're able to get back together in person with people you know to make that happen but but even if not like for all the people who never could make it to an in-person event in the years to come they're going to be able to do this and still honor and still remember in such a powerful way through through this you know program that you set up Thank you. Exactly. We're thrilled that you're coming alongside us. So thanks for throwing kind of your heart and energy into remembering with Wear Blue Run to Remember. We're excited to work with awesome. Team Red, White, and Blue. Awesome. Well, thanks a lot, Lisa. Really appreciate it. Look forward to seeing you on the uh, on on social media on Memorial Day. But before then, you know, continuing to see uh, your face and your voice as you're continuing to project out and, and to really you know help you know the nation to remember and to honor. So thank you. Thanks, Mike.